All right, guys, Kiara Pickers here wanting to talk to you about hash rate. So a couple of weeks ago, the price of Bitcoin crashed from 10,000 to 8,000. And at the same time, there was a story circulating around about the Bitcoin hash rate. Now, many people know about the Bitcoin hash rate, but they don't understand how it's measured. So I want to talk about what Bitcoin hash rate is, how it's measured and how that caused some misunderstanding and probably caused the price to crash as well. So first things first, okay, high level understanding of what hash rate is. Hash rate is the total number of miners, or I should say the network hash rate is the total of number of miners computing hash functions in proof of work, all right? That's a lot of words, right? It's a lot, there's a, it requires a lot of background knowledge to understand what that means. So I'm just gonna go ahead and push over to the slides and get into that now. All right, we're gonna start way, 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 way back, back at the concept of a time chain. All right, to understand hash rate, we first have to understand the blockchain as a decentralized clock. A clock is a system that's regulated by its internal structure to keep time. So I'm gonna bring up three different examples of clocks. So we have a pendulum, we have a quartz crystal, and we have an atomic clock. As you'll see here, this one's the simplest. This is a pendulum swing. So every one swing represents one second. So that oscillates back and forth, also called the frequency reference, and that constant rate is how we measure time. The faster the frequency rep reference happens, the more accurate it is. A crystal oscillator clock contains a piece of quartz, usually shaped like a musician's tuning fork. A battery inside the clock sends an electric signal to the quartz, causing the fork's prongs to vibrate at exactly 30,768 times per second. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. So the next one is an atomic clock. The atomic clock was invented by the U.S. government for research, yada, yada. The idea is, is that atomic clocks, they heat up celsium atoms that are then passed through microwaves, and then that causes the celsium atoms to vibrate at a very consistent rate. That rate is something over 9 billion. I'm not going to read that number because it's completely ridiculous. Now, now that we understand clocks, right? So clocks use these different type of, of frequency references to to regulate their own sense of time. All time is kept through different types of oscillations. The blockchain is also a clock, but this clock is much more complicated because it's a decentralized network of computers trying to issue currency and process transactions and also keep time, right? So it's, it's way more complicated than just a clock. Uh, but at the base, the clock is what makes it trustless and that's what's so cool. Now, I want you to think of each block in the blockchain as a sort of tick in this decentralized clock. Now, I do understand that the idea of a time chain, and that's what this is called, the idea of a time chain isn't as clear visually as the idea of a blockchain, but it will, it will shed some light into what it is we're even talking about when we talk about blockchains, because so many people repeat this mindless phrase blockchain, and they have no idea why there's a chain, they have no idea why there are blocks, and they sort of miss the point entirely, right? But if we call it a time chain, we can, Although we can't visualize it quite as easily, we can think, okay, well, why does the ledger need to keep time? And it's primarily for two reasons, right? Well, the blockchain, at least with Bitcoin, is both a payment system or a payment processor and it's a currency. So we need the blockchain to process payments and we need it to issue currency in a reliable fashion. And because this is a ledger, it's actually not, it's not just it's not just time that we're interested in, it's actually the transaction orders that we need. We need time in order to establish order of transactions. So within each block, I'm getting a little nuanced here, and this is sort of a divergent from the original conversation, but within each block, transactions are just ordered zero through whatever, right? They're not ordered according to time. Only the blocks themselves are ordered by time. So if, if, if two transactions happened in one block, we say they happened at the same time, the same block confirmation. The next block is a is a transaction that has occurred later. And I am going to do a video series and I'll probably include that about why this is the case and why the blockchain operates this way, because there is a technical reason why that exists. OK, back to the idea of proof of work. So Bitcoin regulates its time based on proof of work. Now, we could think about proof of work in a number of different ways. I just really only need you to understand the high level in order to get this concept. So. There are two primary actors in proof of work. There are full nodes and there are nodes or full nodes and there are mining nodes, which are pretty much just called miners. And what these what these two entities do is that the full nodes validate and the 
miners do the work. So let me phrase it another way. Miners do the work, full nodes check the proof. So it's proof of work and you have those two separate computer functions. Now, what miners do in this proof of work, the, the doing the work and showing the proof part, well, this is the part that regulates the blocks. So if you can imagine, again, the blocks are this big tick in this decentralized clock. Unlike a pendulum swing that happens on a very repeatable basis, it happens just by nature, right? You just swing the pendulum and then the, the, it just happens to swing in this nice little oscillation with the, exactly the one second. Uh, so the blockchain is much more complicated and its swing has to be regulated differently. We can simplify this because you, you might notice that I'm sort of struggling to figure out how to say this. Uh, and I'm just sort of, I'm just trying to unravel this or unfold this for you in as beautiful as way as possible so that you can really understand this at a big picture. And the best way I know how to do this is to use this mental model called a bl like black box thinking, right? And this is very common in engineering, but when a system is too complicated, you just hide all the complexity way in the box and you just look at the inputs and outputs. So the inputs to mining are electricity, hardware, and money, right? You have to, you have to buy the computers, so you have to spend money on the computers and you have to spend money on electricity. So you have these three resources going into mine. And the, the end result of that are these confirmed transactions. Also, the reward of actually being granted with Bitcoins, because the reason why miners mine Bitcoin at all is so that they can be rewarded with something, right? Well, if you could imagine all of the computers in the network that are doing the process of mining, right? I could be mining at my house. There could be a mining facility you know, in Texas, which that, there was just a news article about Peter Thiel starting mining in Texas. There's tons of miners in China. There's miners all over the world. Miners also have a failure rate. So eventually miners just break. They fall off the network. Okay. And then you have to replace them. So over the course of time, miners are dropping on and off the network. Now that actually complicates the issue of regulating the blockchain sense of time, because if we want transactions to be processed, in a regular time interval, if we want new Bitcoins to be issued regularly, it's very difficult when you have computers dropping on and off all the time, right? So how do we stabilize this? Well, first, let me get the terminology correct, okay? So we call, we call Bitcoin an open and permissionless network, and it's called that because miners can join and drop off at any time. The network hash rate is dynamic. So this is also called hash power. So hash, hash rate and hash power are interchangeable words. That is the total number of computers performing proof of work is always changing. So we're thinking of proof of work as just this big computer problem that does work and shows a proof, right? We're super, super op oversimplifying it just so we can take away the, the one part that we actually care about. This is a typical graph that you'll see at the network hash rate over time. Now, here's where we're starting to get, some, get to some explanation as to the, the misunderstanding that happened that caused the price to crash. Well, on a daily level, hash rate fluctuates all the time, right? So you'll see hash rate, you'll see computers dropping on and off all the time. And that's totally normal. I, I created a short link for this, but this is just blockchain.info. So you can also go to this short link to see that same graph. Now, if hash rate is changing all the time, daily in fact, how is it that we get the Bitcoin network to regulate blocks and keep them regular. Like that's what I mean by regulate is how do we keep blocks coming in the same time interval? So in a hypothetical world or in an imaginary world that we can use to simplify this whole thing, if hash rate was totally stable, right? Just like the pendulum swing is stable. If hash rate was totally stable and it never changed, which we know isn't true, but we're just simplifying it, then the system is designed to have blocks created about every 10 minutes. But we know, the, we know the network hash rate isn't stable. So if a whole bunch of computers join at once, well, then you have blocks being found closer together. If a whole bunch of computers drop off at once, then you have the blocks being found further apart. Now, when we get to the issue of the feedback loop, proof of work also has a difficulty variability on it. So what the network or what the blockchain is designed to do is it counts blocks. Right? It can't count time because it doesn't have a timer on it. It doesn't have a clock on it. it it's trustless because it doesn't check any third party sense of time. What it does have is, is, is its own blocks. So knowing, this is super cool, but like knowing how, knowing how fast blocks are being found, or I shouldn't say that. If you, if you, in an ideal world, let me go back to this graph. 
In an ideal world where hash rate is not changing, blocks are found every 10 minutes, okay? And that's because the network is designed to make the difficulty level exact to the current level of hash rate to make it mineable in 10 minutes. Now, when a whole bunch of miners join, what the feedback loop does is it increases the difficulty so that because there are more miners, they have to go slower again. And if, and if a whole bunch of miners drop off, it lowers the difficulty to adjust for that to, to adjust to those fewer amount of miners that are in the network so that blocks can be found faster again. So it doesn't actually detect faster or slower, it only detects the number of blocks. And it counts 2,016 blocks, which is just such a, it seems like an arbitrary number, but actually, if we go back to this slide again, 2,016 blocks, if you were to, if you were to find a block every 10 minutes, that comes out to exactly two weeks, right? So every, about every two weeks, the network difficulty is changed to to recalibrate this network at finding blocks at about 10 minutes. Now, I know that's a lot of words, so let me try and simplify this further. So the idea is, is that you like your toast lightly toasted, right? Just a very light toasted brown or golden brown. And you know it takes 15 seconds to toast the exact bread you like and to get it the exact color you like. Now, when where that becomes problematic is when you have a new input or a variance of input. So let's say now you wanna toast a frozen bagel. Okay, a frozen bagel is gonna take much longer, but you don't know how much longer. Now you could do tr through trial and error, guess at what, how long you would need to keep this frozen bagel in the toaster. Or you can develop a more sophisticated toaster that has its own feedback control loop, like a color sensor. So here you have a color sensor that's detecting if it's that light golden brown color, and then it just stops it when it's time. Now, to abstract this example and just look at the general case of a control loop, you have input, you have controls, you have output, and you have feedback sensors. So you put, you have, the reason why you would want to use this mechanism is because your input varies and you want the same output no matter what your varied input is. I think that's such a cool system. So I'll show you the example in Bitcoin now. We have a total network hash rate that, that varies. We have proof of work that is adjusted by its difficulty. And the result is not just the block with confirmed transactions and new Bitcoins being released, but the actual desired outcome is to have that happen every 10 minutes as well. So I can also compare that to two examples from 2014, 2018. So in 2014, you'll see that the network, the input network hash rate was 10,000 uh, terahash per second, and the difficulty was 1.6 billion. In 2018, the hash rate just skyrockets, right? The difficulty increases to match that, but the, the, the block time is still the same. The time between blocks is still about 10 minutes. You can look at that visually and say, whether there's a lot of miners or very few miners, the goal and the, the actual achievement of the blockchain is that it regulates everything to happen. It, it regulates time between blocks to be within 10 minutes, and that is super, super cool. So... Why, why did, what, what is it about this that people misunderstood that caused the price to crash? Because that's exactly why I'm making this video. And what it was is that there, we don't actually have any mechanism for knowing what the total hash rate is. So when you see graphs like this, this isn't fully accurate. This is a reverse sort of calculation all based off the time between blocks. All right, so if I go back to the slide with just the blocks on it, right? Let's go back to this one. If a whole bunch of blocks, if, if the network hash rate, if the network hash rate is totally stable, blocks are on average found every 10 minutes, but not always, right? Because I keep using the term on average, sometimes they're further apart. Sometimes they're closer together. What happened that caused the price to crash is that a couple of blocks were found super, super far apart. People panicked. And then this graph showed the hash rate as taking a nosedive. Now, the reason why that would cause the price to crash at all is because miners are viewed as somewhat of taking a bid on the next Bitcoins being created. They're willing to spend resources to buy the Bitcoins that are being created in the form of the block subsidy that they receive. If, ne if network hash power is crashing, well, then people are less willing to buy Bitcoins, therefore the price should crash, right? That's the thinking behind it. Whether that's true or not, I mean, I, I don't actually have any problem with people making that that logical leap. The problem that I have is that a couple blocks apart from each other does not make a network hash rate crash. 
Okay, it actually takes quite a bit of time in order for you to determine whether or not any type of uh, change in the hash rate has occurred. So if this process of readjusting the difficulty happens every two weeks, well, then it would take about that time in order for you to make a concrete assessment as to whether or not network hash power is actually dropping, right? So if the difficulty had dropped not just once, but twice or three times, that would be a really good indication that network hash rate is dropping. If the time between blocks was so, was so slow that it caused a difficulty to fall, that would be cause for concern in terms of actual total hash power dropping off. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I hope you like this video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please do leave a comment in the comment section below. Uh, you may have noticed that there was a lot of background information required to get to this just like small topic that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and because there's so much there's so much misunderstanding in this industry, I probably need to go back and just do an intro to Bitcoin series so that I can link to that. And the next time that I want to do a weekly video talking about misunderstandings in Bitcoin, I can just plug that whole series so that, okay, if you before watching this video, da, 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 just watch the series so that you can get caught up and understand what the hell we're talking about here. All right. So that's it for this week. And I will see you in the next video.